Good afternoon. Good evening. It is seven o'clock. We're going to get started tonight. We'll be in the book of Genesis. We're going to start truly on chapter two, verse one. Said a few words about it last week, but um, or last week, last night. But we'll go into it a little bit deeper tonight. Okay, we'll do a little bit more. Um, I'm not going to go very deep. I think it's something you can read on your own. But I'm not, <laughs> I'm not unwise to believe that many times you don't go as far except what the teacher goes. So it's always imperative that I go a little bit further each time, and we'll try to do that this time. Okay. Um, memory verse. And this week we have, we're going to do three in a row, and then we're going to take that last week, and then we're going to do these three in together. And the, this is Proverbs 18, 22. Proverbs 18 and 22. Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord or from the Lord. I have to look it up. I'm trying to memorize these very early on, so I don't wait to the last minute. That's of the Lord. Whoso findeth the wife, findeth the good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Very good. This is in the book of book of Gen, uh, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22. Let's open in the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this opportunity we have. Gather in your name. Thank you for those who are listening in. Those who listen by replay, we pray, dear Lord, that your Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us and direct us. And may we do those things that are pleasing in your sight. Give us an understanding of your judgment, your mercy, your grace. Praying for those that are lost, that they may be saved in Christ. Let me pray. Amen. Um, we're in that book, Genesis. Genesis is that book that sets the stage for the rest of the Bible. Without the book of Genesis, you can't have the rest of the Bible. You don't know about the fall. You got to have the fall. That's correct. Um, let's go to the quiz for tonight. It is, let's see. I think I made one up. Okay, here we go. Okay, come on now. What day were the fowls made? I think that's day five. Let's go and look. In chapter one and verse number 20, that the waters move, bring forth a bundle of the moving creature that life and fowl that fly above the earth. So we're on the fifth day. Number two, what day was the land creatures made? Um, six. On the sixth day, let the earth, verse 24, bring forth the living creature. Three, what day was man made? The sixth day. And God said, let us make man in our image, verse 26. Four, who did God tell to be fruitful and multiply? It's a trick question. That's a trick question. Excuse me. Um, we know that God told Adam and Eve, but did you know that he said this to the animals? Remember what we read? In verse 22, and God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas, let the fowl multiply on the earth. He said the, the fish, the, the, the animals, the, the fowl. Yes. Interesting. What day was the sea animals made? The fifth day. We studied that already. Six. Who did God bless? Hi. He blessed on that desert. Remember? And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply. And of course, we know in verse number 28, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply. So he did not just man. But my point is, there's a lot of similarities with the animals, with the king, the animal kingdom. Seven, what is the image of God? No, it's not eyes and the hair and the facial expression. And uh, But God is a spirit. And they worship him, worship him in spirit and truth. So when man is made in the image of God, there is a God consciousness. Uh, there are things like uh, the knowledge of sin that he knows. 
uh, that he sh- what he should do, but God gives him free will to make his choice what he wants to do. But it's in him to worship morality. Um, that those things that that God man is like God in many respects, but it's not the physical appearance, and that's what we wanted to bring out. What is meant by when God says, let us, when he says, let us make man in our own image. God is a trinity. He is a, he is three people manifested in one God. I can be one and also be plural. We went over that. If you want to look at uh, last night's uh, message, one just prior to this one, uh, not message. It's a, I'm teaching the lecture. I'll call it like, like that. You can look at that one. And we went through it where, uh, how a man and woman show pl- God is plural and also is singular. It means that God has the one God, but there's three gods. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, but they're all one. What did God give to Adam to be like God? A couple of things. It gave him dominion over the animals. Remember? Um, um, let's see. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. And that's in verse 26. To be like God, to have dominion over something else. It's like he is, uh, really, Adam is that in that manner like God, giving him dominion. We know later he'll be able to name the animals. God created male and female, true or false? <laughs> so, Bill Harris, that's a trick question. Yeah, it, the answer is too obvious, isn't it? It is obvious. It's very obvious. So when you find the America saying that a man is a woman and a woman is a man, you know it's a farce. It's it won't last, brothers and sisters. It won't last. It, it just can't. What you'll end up happening is you're going to find women being uh, relegated to where they were before. Uh, they'll be back in the dark ages where they were treated as cattle and sold and bought, and that has happened in the past. Because now men are going to dominate everything there is. So what happens? Suddenly you got the women, all the, especially all the sports. You know, men will just dominate. They'll just make money. So well, I'm, I'm so-and-so. And so what, what happens is you won't have the Serena Williams and others playing. You have men dressed as women playing. And, of course, they're stronger. And they're going to beat them. Uh, the swimming, the elite. Yeah, that's what will happen. The jobs. You gotta have so many women. Well, I'm a woman too. Instead of the men just take the roles over as women. And where are the women gonna end up? Well, she believes she's a man. She can't compete. That's the problem. You can't compete. There are many things men, women can't do like men. Men can't do a lot of things women do. They can't give birth. Oh, yeah, they're trying to do this thing. It's ungodly what man will try, but It doesn't last. It goes so far as this. Now, of course, I'm the, I'm a thinker. So I take it down to the next level, to the next level. And God told me, says, you know, pretty soon we're going to be able to clone mankind. Or we'll be able to take three people and take part of them, put it in a test tube and create a person. So that's great. What will you accomplish? He says, we, God doesn't tell us how to do it. I said, you, you know why God put marriage there and they call it love? You know the word eros in Greek means? It's love. The, the love, there's four words for love in the Greek. That's how you have a baby. Not in a test tube. That baby didn't come out of people and their love for one another and their commitment to each other. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, you could take it. You, well, well, it's not the same. I say, yeah, you didn't. You didn't. It just doesn't work. You know, they try so much. They try so often, you know, and often. Oh, let's see. I'm sorry. Uh, this is an important text I received. Just to say thanks. Thank in. Thanks. All right. So. I digress in trying to go back and look at Genesis and see how God created man created man in his own image, in the image of God as we're studying here right now, and how God made him, and he made him male and female. This is where it begins. 
I'll take you to another place in the scripture soon. All right, explain after his kind. That's the extra credit. After his kind means there's only one progenitor, one, one beginning, and you can branch off and make different kinds. Now, this is a common thing that man has copied. I'm reminded of how we had the Chevrolet car. But you had, through the years, the Chevy Lumina. You had the Monte Carlo. You had the Chevy Camaro. Uh, you had the Chevy Chevrolet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they're all Chevrolets, aren't they? Well, they're all cats, whether it's the, the their felines, whether it's the, the bobcat, the cheetah, the lion, the leopard, the simple alley cat. They're all cats. They do not change their species. Never has happened. We went through that the other night. I won't take time with that tonight. That's what it means after the kind. So you, you, if you look in history, you see animals that are that are no longer here, that are extinct, like the dodo bird and others. They say, well, they're, it's a sad thing that we still have evidence of the original here. Man, kind of forgets that. You know, forget that. You know, dogs, man, they've been bred and, you know, the, the Irish setter, the English setter, the point, they're all kind of different. It's cocker spaniel, the, such a spaniel that there's so many different kinds of dogs, yet they're all dogs. All right. Hope you got something out of that. Let's move on now. Let's go to the book of Genesis. We're going to start in chapter two tonight. Um, God created the earth and the heavens. And we began with all creation in chapter one. There are different arguments for the for the um, presence of God or the existence of God. The teleological arg argument, the cosmological argument, but the moral argument is far more important than anything else. The evidence of God is you are you know that there's sin. There's a God consciousness in everyone, but you know there's a God. You just don't want to serve it. Um, yeah, that was well, Higgs boson, bison, um, the God particle. Nah, it doesn't exist. If they're, they're trying to find a beginning in the universe. Go to the beginning, you'll find God. Where's his beginning? He didn't have one. He always existed. Well, that can't happen. That's because you're dealing with something called time. And there's no such thing as time with God. And in our, in our finite minds, we can't do that. I don't know if we can ever do that, even when we get to heaven. Because the Bible says we still have time when we get to heaven. Yep. All right, so let's go to chapter two. I'll say a few things about this blessedness. Um, we got to talk about the Sabbath. This is one of those things that is the Sabbath day. The Sabbath is so, the, the importance of it is monumental. Um, let's see. Did you know there's different calendars through the years? But almost every calendar in every country and every nation is a seven-day calendar. The Bible has a lot of influence still in the world and the timelines and how we look at things. But God rested on the seventh day. So we know there were seven, there were seven days of, of work. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the seventh day is what we call the Sabbath. God rested from his work on the seventh day. And as I explained last night, it has to do with what God's going to do later on. But the word Sabbath, it means to rest. This is to rest. God rested from his labors. He ceased from his work that he was doing. On the seventh day, God, he rested. And the heavens and the earth were finished at, and they're all their hosts. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day. The seventh day, he did nothing. He didn't work. And guess what? Well, he didn't do anything. So when did he start back working? He never did. Well, why would you say? 
see, think of it like this, okay? The, the work that God's going to do, he completes it in six days. The seventh day rests. What about the eighth day? He didn't do anything. Ninth day, didn't do anything. Why did you say six days? Because the seventh day, he rested. It is clear there is an importance to the seventh day, even though he doesn't work. There's a monumental importance to rest. It is something that God gave to you and I. How many of you can go without resting? You can't. So I work seven days a week. You'll better find some rest because you're going to crash and burn. That's why God gave us seven days. You need a day of rest when you do absolutely nothing. Now he ceases from his labors. But God gives a rest to people where they don't have to work. And it's explained. I got a few scriptures I want to explain through the scriptures. Now, but first of all, let's take a few topics that we need to study in this. Why do we not observe the Sabbath? Why do we observe the Sabbath now? Well, let's go to the calendar. What's the first day of the week? Sunday, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Saturday is the seventh day. Now, the seventh day Adventists, of course, they celebrate on that day. They're confused. Uh, they're following uh, the teachings of a lady by the name of White, and they're just confused with that. But we don't celebrate the Sabbath any longer. Now, the reason is because of Jesus. He fulfilled the Sabbath day. The reason the Sabbath day was holy is because it pointed to the work of Christ on the Sabbath day. When that work was completed, Sabbath day is finished. Well, what day of rest do we take now? A day of rest. Well, the early church, they laid it set aside on the first day of the week when Jesus rose from the dead, the most monumental thing in history that ever happened. They began to celebrate on a day of rest on the day of the resurrection. And that became the day of rest, Sunday. It is the first day of the week. It changed, I mean, thousands of years of history. Well, Moses was around 1500 BC and uh, they changed it. So it's not 1500. No, the Sabbath was already back here. It was created. It's the marriage was first. And then the Sabbath was the second institution that God created. And it goes that far back. Why don't we celebrate it? It's been fulfilled. Jesus did the work on the Sabbath day. That seventh day of labor, God still worked. What does that mean for you and I? Um, if you don't observe the Sabbath, you're okay. In fact, I'm going to take it to Colossians. I had to get my cheat sheet out. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. Let the um let no man judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of the holy day or the new moon or of Sabbath days. Don't let them judge you in Sabbath days. It's not required, but that's what man tends to do right is there this thing of being judged because you don't take care of the sabbath no, it's okay you do not have to keep the sabbath they are a shadow of things to come but the body is christ <clears throat> second there is um the work of god that comes later so this thing about rest is quite unique in trying to understand why is rest so important. Man ceases from his labor, right? It is. Man has to have days off that he doesn't work. It's important. God gave that to him. So I want to take a couple of scriptures. I'm going to go to them, if you would, right now. Um, 
I want you to go to the book of Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 1, let us therefore fear. You ready? Now I'll let you get there. Let me, let me write this down because there's some people that are trying to translate this, I think, or from other countries. Now we're going to be in Hebrews. Chapter 4, verse 1. Let me see. Verse 11. This concept is explained. We went through it when we went through the book of Hebrews. Now we're going to tie that scripture together. Hebrews 4 and 1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of, etern of entering to his rest any of you should seem to come short of it. The rest of God. What do you mean entering his rest? His rest. Ceasing from laboring. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it, so they weren't saved. For we which have believed do enter into rest. When you believe, you enter into what God calls his rest. You don't labor anymore. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, all the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Oh, my goodness. Rest. What is he referring to? He says, wait a minute. He says, as if I had sworn in my wrath. What do you mean your wrath? Angry about what? If they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. The foundation of the world means Jesus was promised from the foundation of the world that he would come and do that work on the seventh day. The day we're talking about here that's being set aside to be holy. It's the Sabbath. Remember Exodus chapter 20. Remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. That day is a day of rest. And Jesus is going to do a work. The work was planned from the foundation of the world. It was going to happen. For we which have believed do enter into his into rest, as he said. As I've sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he spake in a certain place on the seventh day on this verse. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. That's what we're reading. He said on one occasion. He says here in verse number um, four, he spake in a certain place on the seventh day, and God did rest. Now that's what we read in Genesis Chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, verse 2. Verse number 5. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. When Jesus did the work on the cross and he presented it that next day, the work to give it to God as the payment, throughout all the Old Testament, mankind was working to be saved. He would have to do everything that was in the law. The law was a law of a salvation of works, which man could not do. But he labored and he labored and he labored. And finally, Jesus just comes in and says to mankind, hey, stop what you're doing. Let me do it. He does the work. And now you rest. He says, you enter into my rest. I'm going to do the work on this day. But the seventh day is given to you. You enter into God's rest. Stop working for your salvation. I've done it for you. That's the idea that is behind this. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 6. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and to whom and they to whom it was first preached entered not in, not in because of unbelief. Why did they not enter into the rest of God? What's he making reference to? He's making a reference to the reference... Entering the promised land. That's in the book of Numbers. They were supposed, in Numbers chapter 13, verse, chapter 14, they were supposed to go into the promised land. And they were supposed to enter by faith, just believe what God said. And they did not believe. They did not believe. So they didn't enter into the rest of God. God promised them a land flowing with milk and honey. 
God promised them a place. Listen, it was God's country. It was God saying, enter to my place. But we had to work when we get there. Really? God does all the work. You're just going out there fighting. You're, if you have the faith, you would have done it, right? They didn't, they, originally the people didn't go in because of unbelief. Again, he limited the certain day, saying to David, the day after that, so long a time as it is said, the day of you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day of rest. There remaineth therefore a rest for the people of God. For he, verse 10, for he that has entered into his rest, he also has see, hath seized from his own works. God did this from his, as God did from his. Like God seized from his labor, you seize from your labor. Christ did the work, you seize from your labor. Finally, let us the labor, therefore, to enter into the rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. How do you, you're, let us work. Let us also labor. What kind of labor are you going to do? I'm simply going to believe to enter into that rest of God. Jesus does the work. God says, he, I will do the work. My son will do it. From the foundation of the world, it was promised. And we're going to enter into that rest. We enter into the rest of God. You don't have to work for your salvation. People say, I'm trying to make it in. I mean, they're doing works. You can't do enough works. And you don't need to do works. You need to have faith in God. And whatever you do will be right. And it won't be because you're working to do what's right. It's because you believe what God has said. Now, to back this up, I want you to go also. The book of John, chapter 5, verse 17. John, chapter 5, verse 17. John, chapter 5. Verse 17, you know what? i tell you to pray for me. This, this is a real prayer request. Pray for me that my Bible will last me the rest of my life. I want to hate to get rid of my Bible. It's tearing apart, but I want to keep it because I can find things so readily, so easy. It's readily available. John 5, 17. But Jesus answered, my father worketh hitherto, and I work. What's he referring to, Brother Glenn? Verse 16. Let me go to John 5, 16. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus, Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. So Jesus is playing off of this in the Sabbath day. He said, look, my father worketh here the two, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but said that as he was at, excuse me, that God was his father, making himself equal to God. By the way, even the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and uh, these people, they knew that he was making himself God. He says, the father worketh and I worketh hither too. So Jesus does the work in that reference to the, on the Sabbath day. Turn over to the book of St. John chapter 14. Chapter 14, look at verse number eight. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Show us the Father, and we'd be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been so long time with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou, show us the Father? Believest not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that give, dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. The Father works and I work. If you're going to believe on Jesus, believe on him in the work that he did, that he died on the cross, that he presented his own blood, and the death that God required was given him in that temple. Yes. So there is a rest for you and I. We enter into the rest of God. Think of it like this. Think of it in this manner. 
man works. Right? Try some more. He tries again. He strikes out. He's still working. And finally, here comes Jesus. And he works. So look, stop, 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 stop. No. I'll put it in this manner. Jesus comes in and it's a check mark. It's done. You ceased. So Jesus now, he enters into the rest. Right? He sat down at the right hand of the Father. The work was completed. Remember what he said, the, the second to the last thing from the cross. It is finished. This work on what he had done. All the thing was left was the work to present the blood on the next day. But the Bible says when he had done all that he did, he sat down at the right hand of God. He has ceased from his labors. He enters into that rest. He has completed the work of God. But then look what happens. You don't have to work, but because of his work, you also enter into that rest of God. All that he has, we have. Man had tried all that time. And now he says, simply by faith. No longer will you work, but by faith you're going to enter in. Cease from your labor. And you enter into the rest that God has. Okay, that's enough time that I spent on this. That is sufficient. Let's go. Let's get back, okay? Brother, well, I'm just whetting your appetite so you can sit down and, and, and ask questions. You know, we'll be at church Wednesday night, tomorrow night, uh, uh, Sunday night. Brother Glenn, what does so-and-so mean? Well, how do we get to this here? Nothing wrong with that. Or maybe you, if you have your own pastor. Hopefully they can answer it for you. If you don't know, I know, I've got resources. And maybe God will allow me. I can retire one day and sit down and do this all day and do some teachings and subjects and spend an hour just going over the subject and print it and say it again in a different way. I love I love teaching things again because the first time you go to this angle, the second time I look at it a little different, I go to this angle. And you can see it from a different vantage point. All right, so God blessed the seventh day, sanctified it because it, it rested from all of his life. Verse four, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created and then the day that the Lord God made the heaven, earth and the heavens. So now that is a summation. Genesis chapter two and verse number four is the final step in the creation of the heavens and the earth. That's it. Excuse me, apologize, let me turn that off. It is the final step in all that creation, okay? It is the final one. Let me read it like this. These are the generations, the genealogies, or the, the account of the heaven and the earth being made. That the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And by the way, when you read that word, uh, Lord that is the first place in the Bible that you read the word Yahweh. And, of course, when you say the word Y-H-W-H, I think is the actual word. And then the tetragrammaton, that, that word, don't worry about I have to look it up all the time, too. Uh, this is where we get the word Jehovah. Uh, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses are not really something bad. They're using the word of God, the name of God. That's his witnesses. Do you agree with their religion? No, I do not agree with their religion. I think they're absolutely positively wrong because they believe that Michael is the is Jesus, the archangel, and uh, he is not because Jesus is the only begotten son. They say that means created. No, because if you understand all of chapter five of Genesis, how he begat, 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 you know you're just taking one person and making him the same person again. As I read in the book of St. John uh, and chapter um, where he said, they, I do the works, was it John 4? Um, John 5, when John chapter 5, they knew that he was referring, he was God, that he was the same. Now, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and before it was, excuse me, every plant of the field, before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field, before it grew. By the way, 
for clarity. So if you're using the King James Version, underline the word before there and unlike before it grew for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth there was no and there was no man to till the ground there was no rain there was nobody to till the ground but yet it was there so now you get kind of the order God's giving you details about how things really were chapter one we said God gives you the basics now he gives more detail in chapter two so he says all these things are remember how the chapter in and the second day, he separated the waters of the earth and put a barrier between them. So there's this water vapor around the world. And then you got the waters on the earth and there was an expanse. And somehow or another, there was condensation and they had fog every day that would water the ground. And that's how it didn't fall from the sky. There was a change. It wasn't the same. But there went up a mist from the earth, it came up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And that's how God's ecology was. Man thinks, that, well, you know what? I don't know what we're going to do. The climate change guys, by the way, remember that movie, The Day After Tomorrow? It was a climate change movie, of course, about why we, uh, we're destroying the earth, ozone layer, the, the icebergs. If he didn't put too much wa fresh water into salt water. And all the ah, uh, you know, they just it's just theory, but God has changed the ecology already, brothers and sisters. I mean, he's already changed it because in the beginning, this is the way he watered the earth. What are you gonna do without rain? I don't know. Let's ask God. The Bible says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed in his, into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now some of your versions will say a living being. But the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. Man is different from everything on the face of the earth by two reasons. There are two reasons that man is different. Man. is unique first he was made in the image of god do you believe that second god breathed life into him, right? He became a living soul. Man became a living soul. He breathed in him and man became a living soul. And and that, that's always the, the, the one of those um, very difficult things about how do you decide we can look at some of the things concerning the, the soul. And, and there's some of your Bible say your Bible say a living being. Now, this is what separates us from the animal kingdom. We are created in the image of God. And we know that the animals were not. We know that God breathed into man and he became a living soul. So when you say that we came from an evolution from the animals you know what kind of a slight that is on god that's why evolution is demonic it is demonic it goes against everything that god has said but so does most things that man does now and let me tell you about the soul there's a lot of i'll just whet your appetite with this it is hard for people to understand what in the what is a soul? And I'll just give you a few references to take and look at this. It's oftentimes confused with the man's spirit. Are they separate or are they the same? Now, if you know what I'm going to tell you, what I'm going to tell you is this: you know, hey, 
You got to go to the book. It's got to be. It's got to be in the book, right? You got to find it in the book. Where do you find this? I know where to find it. Well, I hope I got it underlined. <laughs> Hebrews chapter four, I think it is. Go to the book of Hebrews, chapter four and verse twelve. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of both soul and spirit. How sharp is it? It can divide asunder soul and spirit. So they are not the same. They can be separated. In the garden, Jesus said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. We also know that Jesus said on this occasion, he said, look, Fear not him that can destroy the body, but him that can destroy body and soul in hell. Have you ever read those scriptures? So the soul is what, was what we call the seat of a man's affections um, for who he is. It's the seat of a man's affections. Um, Um, do you remember the rich man and Lazarus? Now we know the spirit is, of course, like God of a man. But the soul is the seed of what we feel, it's our affections. And there's always a controversy, is man a soul or does he have a soul? Notice how the scripture states that the man, the rich man lifted up his eyes in hell, being in torments. Now his body was in the ground. Listen. The Bible says in Luke chapter 16 and verse 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed with purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus who laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels of Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Now he was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes. Now if his body, in hell, he lifted up his eyes. It's a soul. It was in torment. It can feel. It can see. Jesus said to destroy body and soul in hell. Okay, that's enough. You can start looking at it on your own. <laughs> so there's a lot of connotations. I won't, I won't go. That's a study on its own. But God breathed in a man. We became a living soul. We became alive. The body is nothing without the soul of the man, the spirit of a man that God puts inside of him. All right, something else. Man, we are made in the image of God that separates from all the animal kingdom. But technically, <clears throat> in Adam and Eve, they are such a unit of the same person. It has to do with God. Did you know that a man shouldn't cover his head because he is the image of God? 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11. Chapter 11 and verse number 4 through 7. <clears throat> Let's read those. This is about, it's a, <clears throat> a chapter on submission. But he says, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonored his head. Every woman that prayeth the prophesied having her head uncovered dishonors her head. That is even all one as she were shaven. Talk about your hair. Don't let your hair grow long. She can cover your head. Women should. For if a woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shameful woman be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Verse 7. 
for man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. Now, woman is like man. She came from man. But a man shouldn't cover his head because he's the image of God. Yeah, you start getting into that. Well, boy, that's kind of deep, ain't it, Brother Glenn? It really is. God, let us make man in our own image. Let's go back and look at this again. You see in the verse, chapter 1 of the book of Genesis, so God said in verse 26, let us make man in our own image. Now, from the Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 26 through 27, you would think that he created Adam and Eve at the same time. But you get further in here and you realize, well, he did not make them at the same time. We'll find this out here shortly. So anyway, let's move on. And the Lord God planted I'm, uh, it's a living soul, verse number seven. Let's move Genesis chapter one, chapter two, verse eight. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put man whom he had formed. Okay. God planted a garden He planted a garden eastward in Eden this location, locality. He put man, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So man was created first before woman. You see, you get specifics in chapter 2. In chapter 1, verse uh, was it 27, and chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, you would think they are created at the same time, but it's not. He put man before him. The Lord God formed, verse 7, man out of what? Dust. He came from actual dirt. He came from the dust of the earth. And God breathed into him and he became alive. He planted his garden and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and underline this word. Two words. Three words. Excuse me. Every tree that is pleasant to the sight Pleasant to the sight. Second, good for food. So now we talk about the trees that he created. He planted a garden. And it says, every tree, every tree, Pleasant to the eye, good for food. That's what God created it for, correct? That's why there's purpose in it. Pleasant to the eye for man to look at it and feel good about it. And it's for it to eat, right? However, he then says, he created two more trees. The tree of life also is in the midst of the garden. He says, no, 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 no. We got the tree of life. In the in tree of life, tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He plants those two trees. 
They're separate from all the others, and they are unique. Now, we know the tree of life. Um, we talked about it the other night. The tree of life is mentioned here. We know this, the rest of the story that Adam and Eve get kicked out of the garden, right? So in chapter 3, I'm sorry. There it is. I don't want to sound right. Chapter 3, verse 24. This is the last verse in chapter 3. So he drove out the man, and he placed in the east of the garden the aid of cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of what? The tree of life. And we also know in the book of Revelation, and in fact, let's just let's go to the church. I think it's the church of Ephesus. Revelation chapter 2, the first uh, church. Verse 7, to he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says of the church, and him that overcome it, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of paradise. And of course, we also have it. Um, we also have it in um, Revelation 22. Chapter 22, verse number 2. In the midst of the street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life. This is, I believe, the same tree, the same exact tree. No different. Um, the same exact tree is there. So, but now we have these other two trees that are going to become very prominent. But we've talked about this tree, the tree of life. Um we know about it, the, it's mentioned in Genesis 3, 24, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7 and 22 and verse 2. <coughs> Excuse me. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, why is it there? Well, let's break it down. we got a few minutes left and we'll get into these other rivers. My goodness. I wanted to talk about this river. I thought I could get that far. The knowledge of good and evil. Think about what it is. What is good and what is evil? This is why I say that the moral argument about right and wrong, good and evil, is the greatest argument to prove the existence of God. What is good and what is evil? You can't have good and evil. There's got to be a separation. We used to say, and of course, this is what Jeremiah told him, you know, Wanted them to call good, uh, was it Jeremiah Isaiah? Wanted them to call good, evil, and evil good? Wanted them to call good, evil, and evil good. Um, you know, people are like that. You know, people are that, that, they're that way. Now we say, by the way, it was last year, the International Women's Day, it's the month of women, women. A man won it dressed like a woman. And the president praised it. Everybody prays it. How a woman of courage. She's not a woman. She never was a woman. She's a man. She's got mental problems. Why does she have mental problems? Because she was born that way. Like I was born that way. Everybody's born that way. It's the idea when the when the gay man says, or the I was born like this. And I'm like, yes, you are. You're right. We're all born sinners. Everybody's there out a proclivity to do what is evil. But only God knows good and evil. Man always messes it up. But if you have the knowledge of good and evil, you will be like God. That's an absolute truth. You'll be like God knowing good and evil. That's exactly. Satan didn't lie to them. Did you notice how Satan put that lie in truth there in chapter 3? If you needed the tree, you'll be like God knowing good and evil. He's holding back on you. You want to be God, don't you? And that was the problem. The reason God teaches us submission is because it's so imperative to submit your will to God. God created man, but God gives him free will. Even though he's created the image of God, he breathed in the knowledge of good and evil, God will never make you serve him. There was a song that came out years ago I loved to sing. He'll make you listen but he won't make you obey. 
That choice is your freedom. Because he loves you in every way. God gave us choice. He brought back choice when he brought Jesus. This tree of the knowledge of good and evil has been replaced with the body of Christ. You don't, you see, you have to deal with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I mean, days go by. You go by that tree, you see it, never bothers you at all. No, God said we didn't need to have that. We didn't need to go near that tree. We're good until Satan came and said, as God said, put a question mark around the word of God. What are you going to believe? What are you going to believe? The knowledge of good and evil. You will be like God. So that tree is unique. It's not like the other trees. There is a difference. God put these two trees there. This one is the tree of life. What do you need it for? Life. What do you need this one? Well, I could be like God if I wanted to. Well, God put it there for a reason. But then he says, don't eat of it. And the first thing you want to say is, God, why would, you, why would you put that tree there? God, why did you put it there if you didn't want me to eat of it? You put it there to tempt me. Test you. Do you love me? Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. <clears throat> do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Mamas. I think it is in the Spanish. You love me? God puts that tree there because you're going to have to have, make a choice. Every person born has to make a choice for God. Well, it doesn't say anything else about it. It leaves it just as it is. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden and came thence. At, it was parted and became four heads. This is the Pison, Gion, Hittichel. Hittichel, I mostly believe, is Tigris and the Euphrates River. A lot of speculation, because we know the Tigris and the Euphrates actually run through Iraq. And I think the Tigris actually runs through downtown Iraq, uh, Baghdad. And on the outskirts of the Euphrates River, and then they come together. They run through the desert. And you can go in the middle of that. There's nothing there, but all along that river, you'll see it's farmland and stuff. There's water there in the middle of the desert. And it's north of uh, the northern part of Syria. And where Iraq is, and Iran's pretty big, and Afghanistan's there, but it goes through Iraq right now. But there's a lot of things to be said because we know that after the flood, we know about the Euphrates and the Tigris River. And the speculation is that man just kept those names, but the flood likely changed the landscape. It probably changed rivers and courses and things. The Great Flood, you know, like the Monument Valley. Look at um, the Grand Canyon, where water dug it. It didn't take billions of years. It took water over the top of the mountains. It started to secede. You ever seen rain fall like this? I'll leave you, th I'll leave you with this because I know we're running out of time. When I was a boy, I grew up on a farm. We always had to hoe grass and pull grass out of the wheat, all these weeds out of the, uh, the plants so they could grow. So they hated grass. So they wouldn't let grass grow around their house. They would never have a lawn. We had to get every bit of grass up. Problem was, every time it rained, it washed the dirt away. You had to haul in dirt and try to pack it. It would never hold it until they started letting the grass grow. But the water comes in and washes things away, changes the whole landscape. Yeah, floods do that, by the way. It changes landscapes. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to come together, to studying your word again. We just praise you, God, that we have this privilege. We ask you, Lord, to help us to understand, help us to remember. And may we contemplate and may we study and think on these things. Bless, Lord, those who listen, those who are diligent. I pray, God, your blessing upon them. And, Lord, those that listen by replay, Father, there's needs that need to be met. And we just pray, God, meet them according to your riches and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your patience. Keep us in your prayers. And uh, we're going to keep studying. Um, so much more you can bring out. You can read it on your own. Now, when Thursday night. We're going to finish up, chapter, probably finish chapter two and chapter three, which is the last one of those first three that set the stage, okay? But I'll try to finish up the quiz tonight, okay? Have a blessed evening. Lord willing, we'll see you then.